Interstellar isn't just a movie you watch, it's a movie you experience, puzzle over, and debate for hours afterward. Christopher Nolan crafted a film so dense with scientific concepts and narrative complexity that even multiple viewings don't guarantee complete understanding, and that's exactly what makes it brilliant. But here's the thing, there are certain aspects of Interstellar that consistently trip people up. Not because they're poorly explained, but because they challenge our fundamental understanding of physics, time, and causality. Today, we're breaking down five crucial elements that most people still don't fully grasp, even years after the film's release. Number 5. The Tesseract isn't actually five-dimensional. When Cooper falls into Gargantua and ends up in the Tesseract, people often describe it as a five-dimensional space. That's technically incorrect, and understanding why matters for grasping what's really happening. <laughs> Tars explains it perfectly. The future humans constructed a three-dimensional space inside their five-dimensional reality specifically so Cooper could understand it. They're translating higher dimensional physics into a format a human brain can process. It's like showing a 2D representation of a 3D object. You're not actually in the higher dimension, you're viewing it through a lens designed for your limited perception. What Cooper sees is every moment of Murph's bedroom existing simultaneously, past, present, future, all laid out like books on a shelf. In our normal three-dimensional existence, we experience time linearly, one moment after another. But in this construct, time is a physical dimension Cooper can navigate through. He can reach into any moment of Murph's life because from a five-dimensional perspective, those moments all exist at once. The confusion arises because we're trying to visualize something that's fundamentally beyond visualization. Nolan does his best to represent it through the infinite bookshelf structure, but that's still just a metaphor. The actual physics of five dimensions can't be properly shown on screen because our brains literally can't perceive them. Number 4. They didn't change the past, the past already happened exactly as it needed to. This is where people's brains start to hurt, because Interstellar presents a closed time loop, and our minds aren't wired to process causality in circular terms. Here's what people get wrong. They think Cooper goes back in time and changes things. That he creates the dust patterns that lead young Murph to the coordinates. That he knocks the books off the shelf to communicate, stay. But that's not what happens. Cooper doesn't change anything. He enacts what always happened. I've been doing for Murph. They're doing for me. For all of us. Cooper people couldn't... The ghost was always Cooper. The coordinates were always his message. The watch was always transmitting the quantum data. From the perspective of the universe's timeline, all of this occurred simultaneously. Young Murph experienced the ghost. Adult Cooper became the ghost. Both things are true at the same time because time isn't linear, it's a flat circle. Tars actually spells this out explicitly. He tells Cooper they weren't brought to the Tesseract to change the past, because you can't change the past. What happened, happened. But what people miss is the implication. Cooper's actions in the Tesseract were always part of the timeline. He's not rewriting history, he's fulfilling it. This creates a paradox only if you insist on linear causality. Where did the information come from originally? How did the loop start? The answer is that it didn't start. In a closed time loop, there is no beginning. The loop exists as a complete self-contained system. It's counterintuitive, but it's consistent with Einstein's field equations. Number three, plan A was always possible. Professor Brand was just wrong. This is perhaps the most misunderstood plot point in the entire film. People come away thinking Professor Brand lied because Plan A was genuinely impossible. That's not what happened. Plan A failed because Brand gave up, not because it couldn't work. There, there was no need for him to come back. Brand tells Murph his equation was incomplete, that it couldn't reconcile relativity with quantum mechanics. He needed data from inside a black hole's event horizon, which is impossible to obtain, so he gave up on plan A and focused entirely on plan B. But here's the critical detail people miss. Brand gave up decades before the mission even launched. He solved the equation before Dr. Mann ever left Earth. He knew exactly what he needed, quantum data from a singularity. 
and when he realized he couldn't get that data, he declared the problem unsolvable. Except it wasn't unsolvable, it just required circumstances Brand couldn't foresee. Cooper gets that data. TARS records quantum measurements from inside Gargantua's singularity and transmits them via gravitational waves through the Tesseract. Cooper encodes them in the watch. Murph receives them. She completes the equation. Plan A works. Humanity is saved. The entire sequence proves Brand was wrong to give up. Brand's lie wasn't about scientific impossibility, it was about personal limitation. He couldn't see a path forward, so he assumed no path existed. He sent Cooper and the crew into space knowing they'd probably die, believing their only contribution would be delivering the population bomb. That's not pragmatism, that's surrender. Number 2. The future humans are us. Not aliens. Not some other species. Not higher beings who evolved beyond humanity. They're humans our descendants, and this distinction is absolutely crucial to understanding the film's ultimate message. Cooper explicitly states this in the Tesseract. Tars suggests as they mend the bulk beings constructed this space. Cooper corrects him. They didn't bring us here. We brought ourselves. The beings who created the wormhole, who built the Tesseract, who enabled humanity's survival, they were us, just thousands or millions of years in the future. People struggle with this because it reinforces the closed loop paradox. If future humans save past humans, who saved the future humans? The answer is nobody saved them initially. Because there is no initially, the loop has always existed. Future humanity's survival depends on past humanity's survival, which depends on future humanity's intervention. It's circular causality. But here's the deeper meaning people miss. This reveals the film's central theme. Humans save humans. Not through divine intervention, not through alien benevolence, but through our own ingenuity, love, and refusal to surrender. The future humans could manipulate gravity and access higher dimensions, but they couldn't complete the mission alone. They needed Cooper. They needed Murph. They needed the human element. This is what makes the film fundamentally optimistic despite its apocalyptic setting. We don't need to be saved, we just need to not give up. The future exists because people like Cooper, Murph, and Bran refuse to accept extinction as inevitable. Humanity's salvation comes from human determination. And number one, love isn't the solution. Gravity is. This is probably the single most misunderstood aspect of the entire film, and it's largely Bran's fault. Her speech about love being a quantifiable force confuses people into thinking the movie is saying love literally has power. It doesn't. Gravity does. <laughs> Here's what actually happens. Cooper needs to communicate quantum data to Murph. He's in the Tesseract, she's in her bedroom decades in the past, and he has no conventional way to reach her, but he has gravity. Tars explains it clearly. Gravity can cross dimensions, including time. It's the only force that can. Cooper manipulates gravitational waves to move dust particles, knock books off shelves, and alter the second hand of Murph's watch. These are all physical effects caused by gravitational manipulation. The science is speculative, but consistent. Gravity is the mechanism. Love is the motivation. So why does everyone think love is the solution? Because Cooper says it is. When Tars questions how Cooper will communicate with Murph, Cooper responds, Love, Tars. Love. But he's not saying love is a physical force. He's saying love is why he knows he can reach her. To such complicated data to a child. Not just any child. Cooper's connection to Murph is what allows him to find the right moments in her timeline. The Tesseract shows every moment of her bedroom, but Cooper knows exactly when to intervene because he knows his daughter. He knows she'll come back for the watch. He knows she'll understand the message. Love doesn't transmit the data. It tells him where and how to transmit it. The film's actual message is far more sophisticated than love conquers all. It's saying that scientific knowledge, gravity, relativity, quantum mechanics, combined with human connection, love, trust, understanding, creates possibilities neither could achieve alone. Murph solves the equation using quantum data, but she only gets that data because Cooper knew how to reach her. Science and emotion aren't opposed. 
They're complementary. These five points fundamentally change how you understand Interstellar. It's not a movie about love saving the day through mystical means. It's about how human ingenuity, scientific understanding, and emotional connections combine to overcome seemingly impossible obstacles. The Tesseract isn't magic. It's advanced technology. The time loop isn't a paradox. It's self-consistent causality. Plan A wasn't impossible. It just required information from an unexpected source. The bulk beings aren't aliens, they're us. And love isn't the solution, it's the reason we keep searching for solutions. Understanding these elements doesn't make the film less emotional or meaningful. If anything, it makes it more profound, because it's not saying the universe cares about us, it's saying we have to care about each other.